Good morning, everybody. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present our work here. So I will talk about multiple stable memory states in an antiferromagnetic uh, semiconductor, in particular case manganese telluride. But before I present the main results of this work, I wanted to show you how anisotropic magnetic resistance uh, looks in ferromagnets, where it's very well understood. And I will then show how it was previously detected in antiferromagnets, and then I will come to the, to the main part of the talk. So AMR, so anisotropic magnetic resistance, is, is uh, an harmonic dependence of the resistance on the magnetization direction versus the current, and it's typically measured by applying a magnetic field in the saturation regime to, to ferromagnet, for example, here is in films, and then you rotate this, uh, this field in various directions with respect to the current uh, direction, and you detect this uh, harmonic variation of the resistance. And it's presented in different ways, but effectively you see this uh, cosine two times the angle between uh, magnetization and uh, current in, in, the, in the system. Then when you detect it via the transversal uh, contacts of a hold bar, you, you get a, a different trace, which is from the same effect, but it's shifted to a, a sine-like uh, effect. This is the, the most common uh, contribution, is this non-crystalline contribution, which is, has this harmonic dependence, as it's seen here. When one looks in detail, then there is a more terms uh, which contribute to, to AMR, and for example here for, for a cubic material, for, for this gallium manganese arsenide, it was shown that there are also crystalline terms, and the crystalline terms, they then depend on the direction of the magnetization, not versus the current, but versus a crystal direction. So you need a single crystal, obviously, to detect this, and uh, we, will see, we will see how this also uh, looks in antiferromagnets. So in antiferromagnets, we would expect the same uh, effect, Nell already said, like effects which are even, depend on even order of the magnetization, should show the same variation in antiferromagnets as in ferromagnets. So we expect that the nail order would also lead to uh, anisotropic magnetic resistance. However, when people measure uh, such field rotations similar to the one I've shown before, in antiferromagnets, here for example the case of iron rhodium or rhodium manganese, you typically see not too much, more or less flat lines for typical fields which are available of one or two tesla. Of course, Nell was not wrong, but uh, we need to reach a saturation regime in antiferromagnets, and this means, we heard it already this week several times, we need to overcome the so-called spin-flop transition, and here this uh, typical picture of manganese uh, difluoride, where you see that uh, above 9 Tesla, there is this spin-flop transition where when you apply the field along the easy axis, the orientation of the, the moments, and you cross this, uh, this tr transition, then the moments can rotate by roughly 90 degrees and slightly can't, they develop a small magnetization and this magnetization can couple uh, to the magnetic field. And when in, you would now rotate a field bigger than the spin-flop field, you would actually be able to drag along this magnetization, which means the nail order would follow perpendicular uh, to, the, to the field. So and this is what, what I want to show you here, and I will show it for, for a case of a system with, tri, uh, with three easy axes, which, which will be the case of manganese telluride, which is a hexagonal crystal structure. And I will show three uh, different scenarios when you rotate the field smaller than the spin-flop. You might still slightly move the, the antiferromagnet, but it will not really uh, follow the, the, the field or follow the perpendicular direction of the field. You see it might slightly wobble. So here in green you see the, the nail vector. In red you hardly can distinguish it here. It's uh, the magnetization uh, directions of the two sublattices. So this is for a field smaller than the spin-flop. As I said, the nail order might slightly wobble, but not too much would happen. When you increase the field uh, beyond the, the spin-flop, then actually you're able to really rotate the antiferromagnetic order. However, you see now when I am at roughly two times the spin-flop field, you see already that there is a canting, so the red uh, magnetization vectors, they slightly can't towards the direction of the field but they still kind of skip the, the hard axis in between these dashed lines and they stay longer at the, at the easy axis. So remember this. When we increase the field further, then we really come to this case of saturation and it almost follows perfectly perpendicular to the, to the applied field. So this is how you would like to, to work to, uh, with an antiferromagnet to, to detect this AMR. However, that's very tricky because the spin-flop field is, is rather high and therefore it's, easy, it's not so easy to overcome this in the lab. So this is why people found other ways to, uh, to do that, and they detected AMR by, by field cooling, for example, in the case of iron rhodium, which is a particular case where you, when you heat the system, you, you go to a ferromagnetic uh, phase, and then you can apply a 
a magnetic field cool down to room temperature where it's antiferromagnetic. And by this field cooling process, you kind of set the, the orientation of the antiferromagnetic uh, domains and you detect two different resistance states. And, and it was claimed that this is uh, of, of or the origin of these different resistance states is anisotropic magnetic resistance, similar to a case of iridium manganese, or also in this uh, copper manganese arsenide where we heard a lot, where this uh, charge current induced switching due to a special crystal uh, symmetry leads to the staggered field, which is able to move the antiferromagnetic order. And also by symmetry considerations, it was concluded that this, the, the different resistance states are anisotropic magnetic resistance. So now I want to come to the manganese telluride. It's a, it's a semiconducting uh, antiferromagnet, different to most of the works we have shown before, which was either isolators or, or metals. It's a, a rather old material. It was studied a lot in the, in the 60s. There, most of the studies were done on, on really bulky single crystals. I will show some of the results of these older uh, works. But we work with single crystalline epitaxial thin films, as, as shown in this TM image. The uh, crystal structure is hexagonal, as I said. The moments are uh, ordered ferromagnetically in these C planes, and then the different C planes are stacked antiferromagnetically. The, the bulk nail temperature is 310 uh, Kelvin, so just above uh, room temperature. And we convinced ourselves that we really deal with a, with a semiconductor, so we looked at the optical absorption and we found a, a band gap around 1.4 uh, EV. We looked at the susceptibility, and here you see the, the kind of uh, textbook like uh, old results from uh, really cubic centimeter sized uh, crystals with a maximum a around the nail temperature, and this is similar to what we see in our, our thin films. We also studied the uh, the transport properties, basic properties, and you see in the resistance, when you vary the temperature, you see a pronounced peak at the nail temperature. So it is not really a, a textbook-like behavior of a semiconductor, but we see really the, the magnetic uh, phase transition around room temperature by this pronounced peak. And it's indeed a semiconductor. We get whole uh, conductance with unintentional toping of, of the order of 10 to the 18, and you see it's, a, it's not in a particular uh, promising material for high mobility studies, but it's, it's let's call it a lousy P-type uh, semiconductor. Anyhow, when we now apply a field to this material, we expected that uh, the anisotropy is rather low and we wanted to see if we can detect AMR. So we went to uh, two Tesla field, which is the highest which we had available, and we rotated it in the plane, so we lithographically patterned a, a, a hall bar. We detected the longitudinal and the transversal resistance changes. And indeed, when we go to 200 Kelvin, which is safely below the nail temperature, and we rotate the field, we really see this harmonic AMR in complete analogy to the to ferromagnets. However, when we cool further, you see it's getting more complicated. These are these uh, faint gray curves here. We, we don't, I mean, in the two, at 200 Kelvin, you have a one-to-one -one relationship between the transversal and, and uh, longitudinal resistance change, which is what you would expect for, for the case of saturation in a ferromagnet as well, and this is similar here. However, when we cool down, then it's getting more complicated. We get different signals in the transversal and longitudinal, and even there is some higher order terms uh, coming up. I will, show, I will show more about this in a minute. But at 200 Kelvin, we, we, we think that with two Tesla, we are above the spin flop transition, and we wanted to see if we can see traces of the spin flop transition also in, in the magnetometry uh, measurements. So we took one of these films, we, we had to take a rather sick one, otherwise there is not enough signal from, from, from these antiferromagnetic materials. We take it to the squid and we, we measure the, the moment versus the applied magnetic field and we see some distinct uh, changes in, this, in the slopes of these measured traces, similar to what you see here. Uh, but you have to consider that now we have a system which has three easy axes. So we can never reach the case where we really apply the field along the easy axis only. We have also always uh, two other easy axes which are 60 degrees rotated, so we, we can never reach this perfect case of a step-like uh, jump, but we have more these smeared out uh, features uh, in these curves. But when we, when we so at, at low temperature, this is recorded at low temperature, and you see in low temperature spin flop somewhere occurs between like yeah, three, five Tesla here. Uh, at higher temperature, at 200 Kelvin, this seems to be reduced because with two uh, Tesla I showed you, we can really get this, uh, this AMR. And I want to show you now more measurements done at low temperature where we really need to, to go to these higher fields to, to get uh, into the regime, into saturation regime. So we took this whole bar and we asked our 
our colleague Jörg in, in Cambridge to use his cryostat, which goes up to 10 Tesla, and we rotated uh, fields of up to 10 Tesla uh, on these uh, hall bars. And we see yeah, we, we, there is a very small variation in the beginning where we are below the spin flop uh, field, and then it increases a lot, and we reach some saturation curves between 4 and 10 Tesla differ only marginally. When we do the Fourier component analysis of this curve, so it's a rather complicated variation, but yeah, I will show you what, what, what actually we see. So we see different components when we, uh, ver when we have different harmonic contributions uh, with respect to this field angle. For example, in the, in the longitudinal uh, resistance, where we see non-crystalline and crystalline terms of this anisotropic magnetic resistance, we see that the dominant contribution is, is indeed this non-crystalline contribution, which has the dependence of two times the, this angle between uh, field and uh, current, or moment and current, I should say. And then we have also contributions which go with 6 phi and 4 phi. 6 phi is most likely not surprising because with hexagonal systems, so we would expect that there is a contribution of, of 6 order, which is most likely of crystalline nature. And then we have uh, more terms which we are not yet completely sure uh, how to interpret them. And we have also the non-crystalline contribution, uh, which we see in the in the transversal signal at the very same time. And we see yeah, there, again, the non-Christian contribution has the, is, is the biggest one. And then we see also uh, one with, with force order, which therefore we think that this term is also somehow of, of non-crystalline uh, origin. But I should point out here also, you see that the curves, they are, especially of the, of the sixth term, this is really flat up to, to two Tesla, and then it starts to increase, and then it saturates here after six Tesla. That, that corresponds roughly to this range of, of where we saw the, the, this evolution of this moment in the squid before. And the, the terms which are of, of non crystalline origin, they already show up before. So we think that this is, can be understood from the fact that, you, as I showed you before, applying a field smaller than the spin flop, you already wobble the moments. So you can already get some, some contributions which are, which are bigger in the case of the non crystalline than in the, in the crystalline case. So to really isolate the, the crystalline components, we, we took the same material and we, we patterned a, a Cobino disk. You see, these are really macroscopic uh, samples. So we, we had such a Cobino disk and we did the same type of field rotations and we found that indeed the predominant uh, contribution we find here is this 6 uh, phi, which is this crystalline contribution. And we have something else which we do not yet fully uh, understand. But I want to point out here also that we can actually determine the easy axis from, from this measurement because we see when we zoom into the, to the maxima and minima of these curves, we see that the maxima, they, they, they start out at smaller fields or intermediate fields uh, rather uh, sharp and then they widen up. In the contrary case, you see the minima, the minima are like wider when you start with uh, smaller fields. So we think that the, the maximum is the hard axis, which is skipped at these fields just above the spin flop, as I've shown you in this video before, and therefore leads to a more narrow signal here. And from this, we actually determine that the, the nail vector is really oriented along this direction, as I sketch it here in this uh, 3D uh, graph. So, so far, basically, these are measurements in total analogy to, to ferromagnets, but now I want to show you when, what happens when you feel cool the system. And in fact, uh, this is strongly motivated by an old work fr from the 60s, and we have already seen these results on, on Monday in, in, in Brian's talk. So it's a torque magnetometry measurement of a really cubic, or uh, not a cubic, a uh, one centimeter cube uh, single crystalline sample, so really macroscopic uh, piece. They do this torque magnetometry measurement, so they apply a field in the uh, direction of the C planes of their single crystal, and then they rotate this uh, field, and they measure the torque, and they see indeed a, a six-fold variation of this torque. So they think that this arises, it's not completely reproducible. You see different traces for different uh, rotations. They're obviously not always uh, the same, but always there's a strong uh, contribution of a six-fold symmetry, and they think this comes from these three uh, types of domains. Now, when they take this uh, material and uh, heat it above the nail temperature and cool it in an applied magnetic field, and then repeat this measurement, they get this result. So they get a suddenly a two-fold symmetry. So they concluded that they can really, by the field cooling process, go from a multi-domain state to a single domain state. Again, there's small uh, reproducibility problems, but there is no six-fold contribution anymore here. So we, we wanted to do the same with our uh, thin films. 
So we, we took this in films, the whole bar. We apply uh, fields in different directions, and I start by showing you the application in, in this red and blue direction because it, this gives the maximum uh, signal in the transversal uh, uh, whole contacts, which are the most sensitive probe for, for this AMR due to this dependence, which I have shown you before. So we heat it above the null temperature, we apply a field, we cool down, and th that's what you see here. So for the blue and for the red field direction, and we see that around 300 Kelvin, where we expect the, the nail temperature, also maybe the nail temperature is slightly reduced from this 310 of bulk in, in our thin films, we see a splitting of these uh, states. And this is, they, they remain split all the way down, and this is the measurement where the field is on while we cool. And then what we do, we remove the field at low temperature, and we measure the same variation again uh, when we heat up in zero field. And what we see is that, in fact, the, the, the split states, they remain in zero field. So we see that, and the merge again at the same point where they started to, to get separate here. So we think that we have some way to, to write some kind of uh, anisotropic magnetic resistance uh, into the system by the field cooling, most likely by the domain uh, distribution, as I will show you later. And now, of course, we can do this in, in, in multiple directions uh, with respect to the current. And that's what we, what we did here. So we, we, we applied the field while we cool in a lot of different directions. And then the measurements you sh which are shown here are always in zero field while we heat up. And you see that yeah, we see distinct traces for, for all the different directions. And when I plot this versus the angle of the, of the cooling field, then we can see this harmonic dependence. And so now basically we see AMR, but in zero field uh, in this, in this antiferromagnet. And it still has more or less this harmonic uh, dependence, a small deviation from this harmonic shape, which I will address in a, in a minute. So before I, I come to the, the modeling of this data, I wanted to show you how this effect depends on the strength of this field cooling. Uh, so we, before the results I've shown you, they were done with, with, with cooling in a field of two Tesla. And here I show you when we reduce the, the field, okay, the effect goes down and there's even some uh, sign change, which we, which we don't fully understand. But, and we also see that the effect is not saturated, so we obviously are not uh, reaching uh, uh, the saturated state where we uh, get really only one domain in the system. The effect is a fraction of percent, so roughly half percent up to 0.6, because you should imagine that you have to normalize it with this uh, longitudinal resistance. So the, the model we have in mind to, to model these data is that when we cool the system from the, the paramagnetic state to the antiferromagnetic state in an applied field that we get uh, a multi-domain state. And by the direction of the, of the field, we actually favor the domain which is closest to perpendicular to the field direction. As I've shown you before, when we would be in this very in this saturation case, then we would be, have all the uh, material in this uh, direction perpendicular to the applied field. So in this case, for example, we have a majority of these orange uh, domains. We do this uh, modeling by a very simple way. We take a stoner wolfhard model considering Seman energy, anisotropy energy, and the exchange energy. We then calculate the domain distribution from this energy landscape by Boltzmann distribution. And from this domain distribution, we can calculate by non-crystalline AMR the, the, the AMR signal, which we expect at, at zero field, just from the uh, unequivalence of the domain population uh, of these three different uh, easy axes, which we get to do the hexagonal crystal symmetry. Just to show you, I mean, when you now think of the, of the hexagonal system and you apply a field and you have all domains available, then of course this is getting a bit more complicated when you rotate a field. But never mind, we use this model basically to, to make such figures. Of course, here I exaggerated a bit the effect so that you can see the rotation better. But we, from this type of models, we get the energy landscape and we can calculate the population of the, of the domains. And this we, we did here, and I mean, I should say that there's not so many free parameters in this model because a lot of things we already know from the previous uh, measurements. So we, we determined the easy axis direction. We can deduce exchange and anisotropy from the spin flop field and from the uh, nail temperature. And we know, of course, also the strength of the field cooling. So we, the only free parameters which we have is, in fact, the strength of the AMR and the size of the domains, which then is important as an interplay between the energy terms with respect to the to the temperature in the, in the Boltzmann distribution. And here I show you when we vary the domain size uh, in the system and we calculate this uh, zero field AMR, then we can get very different uh, shapes of the system. So in the case where you have uh, very small domains, which are 
very likely to have almost all of the three different uh, variants in the same way, then you will get very small variation here. And when you increase the domain size, you can also reach cases where you get these three states, and this means you, you would set three different distinct, uh, more or less single domain states uh, corresponding to three different uh, easy axes. And our experimental case is, is somehow this slightly distorted harmonic uh, case, which is this, uh, shown by these uh, green and uh, red data points. And the solid line is now a fit of our model to the data. And in comparison, I show here a gray line, which would be the uh, harmonic uh, sinus 2-5 uh, curve, which doesn't fully fit to our data. So we are quite confident that we can describe this. And we, we, we also understand that domain size is roughly on the order of this 20 nanometer in, in hours in uh, films. And we did an independent check of, of the mosaic block size of this, uh, in this uh, system, and it, it, we, we found a very similar value. So we are kind of confident that it's not complete uh, rubbish what we get from, from this model, although it's quite simplified. So from the same model, we can also uh, uh, calculate what we would expect when we change the strength of the field cooling uh, field. And this is what you see here is this black line. And the, uh, compared to that, you see the variation of the, of the effect with the, in the experiment. So we, we describe reasonable well the general trend, but we don't describe properly this, this negative effect, which we think is due to the fact that we don't include uh, kind of unco uh, some uncompensated moments at domain boundaries, which might lead to the opposite uh, arrangement of the, of the domains. But except of that, the, the main trend is captured quite well by, by our model. And I want to show you two more slides to, to show the stability of the, of the system with respect to, to applying a field. So we, we can write these, these different states, as I told you, by uh, cooling in different field directions. And, and then we read it while we, in, in zero field while we heat up. So this is the readout for different uh, temperatures. And now before we do this readout, we could also say, OK, we can apply a field. And we already know what we expect. We expect that as long as the applied field stays below the, the spin flop field, that we should still get our, our memory uh, state preserved. And that's also what we find at low temperature when we apply uh, field rotations uh, in the three different orthogonal planes. So by one Tesla and two Tesla, which is just below this uh, spin flop field, we see that the, the effect, the symmetry of the effect uh, stays the same. The magnitude is slightly reduced. So obviously some domains we already uh, switch by these two Tesla, but uh, yeah, with one Tesla we are sa safely below the spin flop and it, it's really that the, the effect is preserved. Similar, we can do this at, at higher temperatures. And I show here, so this was this, these three curves which we get for, for this torturing with one and two Tesla at low temperature, where we are not able to, to kind of destroy the effect completely because we are not able to exceed the, the spin flop field in our machine. When we go to 200 Kelvin, however, we know that we, with two Tesla, we, we can really turn the moment. So we should also expect that we destroy the, the, this memory uh, state. And this is, is indeed what happens. So when we add two Tesla, <coughs> do the same rotations and then measure again at zero temperature up, then we see that the, the effect, the, the memory is deleted, let's say. And here you see also that the, this kind of the, the readout of the memory when we apply a field and, and when we read it while the field is on, then we see, so this, the black curve is always measured at zero field and the colored ones are measured when the field is on and you see there is some, we see the effect of the wobbling of the moments around the easy axis while the field is on. And when we approach the spin flop field, then again, the, the memory states are getting closer because they are getting deleted. Of course, now when we know that we, we, have, uh, we have the possibility to, to set the direction of the moments also by just applying a field, we don't need to heat above the null temperature. And that's what I want to show here. So we, we stayed always at 200 Kelvin here. We applied a two Tesla field in a certain direction then we remove the field and we measure the transversal resistance. And that's what we get. So that's again measured at, at zero field, but after always applying a two Tesla field in a certain direction. And you see we are able indeed to, to, to write the, the states also by staying at a constant temperature when we overcome the spin flop. We might not safely overcome the spin flop completely here because you see the, the effect from the spin, uh, from the field cooling has a, is much bigger than what we, what we obtained by this uh, isothermal writing, let's say. So with this, I would like to, to, to summarize. So I've shown you that we, we can detect this uh, AMR in, in antiferromagnets in complete analogy to, to, to ferromagnets by rotating a, an applied field which is bigger than the spin flop field. So we have to reach this saturation case. 
Then I've shown you that by field cooling, we can reach distinct resistive states and resistance states, and we can actually, by the field direction, write multiple such states which are then stable, and we cannot uh, destroy these states as long as we don't overcome the, the spin flop field in the antiferromagnetic phase. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and all my coworkers for contributing to this work. Thank you.